So hello, this is lecture number four in the 2020 Advanced Earthquake and Tsunami Hazards Training Course. Um, my name is Hallie Kutera, and I am a geologist at the Earthquake Science Center based in Menlo Park, California uh, for the United States Geological Survey. And today I am pleased to be telling you about the tectonics of Eastern Indonesia. So um, without further ado, we'll get right into that. Um, so Indonesia is one of the most tectonically complex places in the entire world. So on the western side, you have the Java Trench and the Sunda Trench um, and the Indian Australian Plate colliding with the overriding Eurasian Plate and subducting beneath it. And um, subduction on that side is fairly standard. Um, I believe in one of Sean's presentations, you saw a really nice seismicity plot where he gets sort of into the nooks and crannies um, of that plate. But um, for this presentation, we're mostly going to be focusing on the eastern side because the eastern side um, is a lot more complicated um, and a lot more convoluted in sort of its plate relationships and geometries. Um, so we're going to sort of be looking at uh, the shapes of the plates, uh, how they got to be that way, um, and sort of their evolution over time and how they all uh, relate to one another um, <clears throat> after moving around for many millions of years. Um, but first you might be thinking, um, why? Why care about tectonics uh, sort of a thing? And um, the answer is that tectonics is sort of the basic discipline for all of the subsets of geology. So you'll encounter tectonics um, in sedimentology or in geomorphology or in volcanology. It's very much a, a core idea um, in um, geoscience nowadays. So just looking at the seismicities plot, you can um, tie together earthquake data and tectonic data pretty easily. So um, here we have um, the blue dots representing shallow um, seismic events where the red dots are more deeper um, seismic events. And so just from this, we can already start to tell um, the shape of the plates and um, if there is subduction happening in an area. So in the south, in the Banda Arc, you can see that there's almost sort of a, a northward subduction happening, whereas in uh, the northern region by Halmahera, there is um, sort of a <coughs> western subduction um, happening. And we'll sort of get into that um, a little bit further, but just looking at a seismic plot can already tell you a lot about um, the geometry of an area. Um, so for this presentation, like I mentioned, we're mostly going to be looking at the eastern side. Um, so basically from Flores and Sulawesi over to New Guinea. Um, and this presentation is sort of broken up into four separate sections, mostly split by geographic region. So first we're going to look at the Banda Arc in the south um, and sort of the shape of that and how um, it came to be that way. And then we're going to look um, towards the Halmahera Arc um, in the north. Um, and this area is unique because um, it's the only two colliding volcanic arcs um, in the world at the moment. Um, and so we're going to sort of um, examine how the plates are interacting up there and what that sort of means. Um, and then we're going to move a little bit south and look at the Sarong fault system um, and sort of how that uh, came to be and how it has influenced um, the location of some of the uh, islands in Indonesia. Um, and then finally, we're going to end by looking at uh, the island of Sulawesi, which is sort of an amalgamation um, of all these past tectonic processes um, and how um, all of that has influenced sort of the, the shape that it is today. <clears throat> so beginning, we're going to look at the Banda Arc. So down here is the Banda Arc. Um, and the first thing that you sort of notice about the Banda Arc is its extreme curve. It has um, around Baru and Saram, it almost makes a 180 degree turn um, all the way down to Timor. And so one of the things, one of the questions we're going to seek to answer is sort of how did this uh, curve come about? Why is it shaped like this? Um, and then the second thing you sort of notice is that there are basins um, in the center of that um, sort of loop. So you have the North Banda Basin and the South Banda Basin, and these are tensional features. So we want to look at why there are tensional features in what should be a compressive zone, because this is a um, subduction zone as we saw by our seismicity plot. So. Um, why would there be an extensional zone in a compressive zone sort of a thing? Um, but the first thing we have to sort of clarify when looking at the Banda Arc um, are some of the uh, competing models. Now, this isn't necessarily a competition because one of them definitely wins out over the other, but I feel like we should go over them uh, just in case you have heard about them. So <clears throat> the first model is the two slab model. So this is, these are models seeking to explain um, the particular shape of this arc. 
So there is the two slab model, <clears throat> which states um, that there is most likely a slab dipping southwards, descending into the serum trough, and another different slab um, dipping northwards uh, through the Timor, Timor trough. Um, <clears throat> And so the problem with this model is that it requires a prior existence of oceanic crust between Saram and Bird's Head, so up in this zone up here. Um, and this is basically saying that if there is going to be a second plate, um, second slab, then it basically needs to be a second plate. There needs to be um, some oceanic crust that is dense enough to be able to subduct um, beneath the continental crust uh, that we see, or, or the, the arc crust that we see um, in the Banda Arc. Um, but the existence of this oceanic crust um, isn't real. There is no oceanic crust. There is absolutely no evidence for that. So there can't be a separate slab there. So basically the, the really only model that uh, most people accept and that is generally used is that uh, the Banda Arc is due to the subduction of a, a singular slab. So this is the one slab model. Um, and if you do have the singular slab, then you need to explain um, how the extreme curve came about. Um, so that's what we're going to seek to do. So Banda Arc, what's with the curve? So I want you to think about 35 million years ago um, when the uh, Australian plate was just beginning to um, subduct and uh, about to collide with the uh, Eurasian plate. So everything's fine and dandy. There's a pretty much a, a simple um, trench that's happening there. It's not really curved or anything. It's, everything is fine and dandy. Um, but the Australian margin comes with this uh, very pointy projection at the top, so it's very oddly shaped. So if you um, sort of look at this first picture here, you can sort of get an idea of that shape. So we have this uh, very pointy projection called the, the Sula Spur, which sort of serves as like a fist. So as the Australian margin then begins to intersect with that, um, we'll call it the Java Trench that's there, um, it is not dense oceanic material. It is continental crust material, so it's very buoyant. So it, it, it's unable to subduct. And so the result of this is that it kind of pushes and deforms that trench. So now that trench is all wibbly wobbly. It doesn't know what's happening. It's all confused. Um, but luckily, um, to the west of this fist, or Sula Spur, we have <coughs> an oceanic embayment called the Banda Embayment. And so basically what happened is that this trench was looking for something to eat up, and all of a sudden this banda embayment came out of nowhere, and this and this oceanic embayment was made of cold, dense, um, old oceanic crust, and the trench was like, yes, that's exactly what I want. And so it began to migrate um, in order to consume that. So since it was unable to um, subduct the buoyant crust of that Sula Spur, it then sort of moved and began to um, change its shape in order to um, subduct the uh, encroaching banda embayment. And uh, this picture is a little awkward to look at because um, we're looking southwards, but here is uh, Timor and Saram um, here. And this one, this is a little bit of a wider view. So here again, Timor, Saram. So here you can see our pink sort of fist punching into our trench um, and our banda embayment waiting to be sort of eaten up um, and sink below the Eurasian plate. Um, so. <clears throat> Flash forward seven million years, so now the trench is beginning to mold itself um, into the Banda embayment. So it's, uh, the Banda embayment is sinking very rapidly because it is so dense. Um, and because our fist is continuing to push forward, um, <coughs> and our Banda embayment is being eaten up so quickly, there is also um, slab rollback. So this trench is, is molding itself into that Australian margin, and it is also causing a lot of slab rollback. So um, things continue to move back into this embayment. But the effect of slab rollback is that the overriding plate, the Eurasian plate, wants to keep in contact with that trench that's sort of moving away. So it's sort of chasing after it. Um, and the result of this is that you get um, extension in the overriding plate. And so this is where we get our North Banda Basin um, extending. Um, and so that's how we have our extensional features inside of our um, Banda Arc nowadays. Um, but during this time, also, as this, as this trench is moving backwards, the plate is rolling back, there's extension in the overriding plate, the Sula Spur has gone through a lot. It has been uh, very much deformed because it's punched its way through this trench, it's causing all of these problems, and um, now it is beginning to break up. So as the trench moves back, um, it actually takes part of the underlying uh, continental crust with it, and so this causes sort of a delamination effect. So the Sula uh, Spur 
then begins to sort of break up and is less of a fist and more of sort of a what used to be a fist. Um, so then moving forward in time again, now we're at uh, four million years. So the um, trench still is trying to mold itself to that embayment. Slab rollback continues to happen. Um, the Sulu's fur is now broken up because it's been delaminated. Um, and the slab continues to sink deeper and deeper into the mantle. So the effect of this, the Australian continent is still continuing uh, to push forward. It's still moving forward, trying to collide with um, the Eurasian plate and the other plates around it. Um, but this plate is beginning to sink. So sort of the um, effect of this is that if you think about like an airplane when it lands, how its uh, little flaps come up and sort of causes resistance. So as this uh, slab is descended in the mantle, it's sort of uh, restricted uh, some of the flow. So it's providing mantle resistance. So it's resisting that northward transport. So it's sort of squishing uh, the syncline as it descends. So this is sort of a plunging syncline. I keep calling it a spoon. So if I call it a spoon, that's what I'm referring to. So it's squishing your spoon. So you can imagine almost like a, like a clay bowl and you, and you squeeze that clay bowl, you might form uh, cracks in the edges. So some people propose that um, because of all of this deformation, there are multiple tears um, in the slab. Um, that's just a result of all of that mantle resistance and all of that pushing uh, by that Australian uh, plate as it continues to move to the north. Um, so then we can go to modern day. Um, as of right now, the uh, band embayment has been completely subducted. There's no more oceanic crust there. The, the trench has been now flush with the um, Australian continental margin. Um, the plate has subducted deep enough that it has encountered the transition zone. So we have a bit of a, a flat portion of that slab because it cannot uh, penetrate any further. So it's sort of this uh, flat portion that's riding that transition zone. Um, there is continued mantle resistance because again, the slab is sort of uh, blocking that northward movement. And so this has uh, resulted in even more folding. So the uh, folds will become more and more pronounced as time goes on. Um, so then here are some tomographic images just to sort of um, give you like a real image instead of a cartoon. Um, so here, cross section A kind of cuts through the entirety of uh, the slab. So here we can see the slab in its whole. So here is the flat slab section, um, riding right in between that transition zone here. And here is BA, which stands for band of slab. So this is the general shape of the subducting slab and then the flat slab portion lying in the transition zone. And then uh, figures B, C, D, and E are sort of cookie cutter cross sections um, that cut perpendicular through the slab, um, B being the deepest, E being the shallowest. Um, so in B here, we can see our flat slab lying in our transition zone. And then here is sort of a leg of that syncline um, cutting through Flores. Um, in C, we see a leg cutting through Timor and Baru. And here is where there is, um, people have proposed there is a tear because you can see that it's sort of, Baru doesn't sort of uh, connect with this other piece here. There's a bit of a hot mantle flow that's happening in here. So this is um, the idea that the slab had been so deformed that it began to crack in a sense, that it, it, it has a tear or, or a hole just because of all of that um, deformation due to that mantle resistance as the Australian plate continues to move to the north. Um, but if you look at D and E, you can really see that nice spoon shape, that, that nice plunging syncline um, here with a leg under Timor and Saram, and then here with a leg under Saram. Um, but yeah, you can see that really nice uh, U shape really come out there. Um, so then uh, further looking at this, here's another seismicity plot. So um, blue being the most shallow, red being the most deep. So blue in the shallow. So this is closest to our, our trough and our old trench. Um, and red being closer um, down where you'd expect the slab to be descending into the mantle. And if we plot this on sort of a 3D diagram, you can really see that really nice scoop shape that sort of comes out of there. So uh, seismicity data sort of backs up the uh, tomographic images and the idea of a uh, single slab uh, subduction and sort of the, the shape that it looks like. Um, so sort of in summary, um, what's up with the curve? So the Banda arc was formed uh, due to a trench molding itself to a curved Australian continental margin. Um, then slab rollback occurred, which caused extension in the overriding plate. Uh, and then there was slab folding um, due to mantle resistance, which then enhances its spoon-like shape. Um, 
So that's pretty much the band arc. So now we're going to move to an entire different part of Indonesia entirely. Um, we're going to go north up here to Halmahera. I forgot that I had a square there. Um, but we, where we looked at down here, we looked at um, the Australian plate and its relationship with the Eurasian plate. Um, whereas up here, we're going to look at the relationship between the uh, Philippine sea plate, the Malacca sea plate, and the Eurasian plate. So a completely different set of plates entirely and a completely different interaction, um, which is super interesting just because those two places are so close together. But um, <clears throat> like I said before, this uh, area is interesting because it's the only two colliding volcanic arcs in the world. And, oh, and the Malacca sea plate in between has um, a very interesting slab geometry because it is subducting in two directions. So the only uh, so the reason that there are two volcanic arcs attempting to collide uh, is because the Malacca Sea Plate is subducting to the west and also the east. So it's fueling both of these volcanic arcs um, <clears throat> and it's sort of bent like a U. So here is um, sort of the general shape. So you can see this really nice fold that's happening in there. Um, and in present day, you can't see the Malacca Sea Plate. You can only see um, a collision complex sort of on the surface, which surfaces um, and is visible on the island of uh, Talad um, to the north, which is um, sort of in between the Halmahera Arc and the Sangi Arc. Um, there's an island right along that ridge, and that's where you can see that um, collision complex. Um, but because there is this high central ridge um, and this continuing subduction on both sides, um, there's a lot of shallow seismicity that goes on there because that is a collision zone. So two things are sort of encroaching upon that and sort of squeezing it together. So you have a lot of shallow seismicity um, on top of that ridge. Um, but here, sorry for all the text on this slide, um, we're going to sort of look at how that came to be. So first we're going to analyze what was going on 10 million years ago. So that is what this figure is. This is 10 million years ago. So in this figure, we have the Philippine Sea Plate to the east, the Malacca Sea Plate in the middle, and then the Eurasian uh, Plate to the west. Um, and so things to notice about this picture, we have the Malacca Sea Plate um, casually subducting like in a fairly normal trench uh, geometry underneath the Eurasian Plate. And there is a resulting uh, volcanic arc on the surface here. So all very normal. Um, and then to the east, the Philippine Sea Plate is doing its own movement, but sort of, you know, synchronous with the Malacca Sea Plate as it moves underneath the Eurasian Plate. Um, <clears throat> uh, Halmahera and uh, East Mindano are sort of forming a ridge. So that's called the EMH Ridge. Um, but you'll notice that Halmahera is not yet a volcanic arc. It doesn't have any um, volcanoes on it because there's nothing fueling that volcanoes. There is no subduction underneath there. So right now it's just Halmahera Island and it's just chilling out here um, along with East Mindano. So everything is sort of working like cogs in a system. All these gears are functioning together. Everything is um, working out really well. Um, and that's until East Mindano decides to collide with West Mindano. Well, I guess it doesn't decide, it just sort of happens. So the Malacca Sea Plate is beginning to close to the north, um, and then these two things collide, and that's where sort of everything hits um, a little bit of a problem, a little bit of a hitch. So the effects of this collision um, stop subduction beneath West Mindano. So as soon as this uh, ridge collides with this island over here, there is uh, an immediate stop in subduction of the Malacca Sea Plate to the north. So that gear absolutely grinds to a halt. And this sort of throws a wrench in the system. And this was the sort of catalyst for all of the events that will follow. Um, so it stops subduction to the north. And um, as a result of this, it very much slows the, the rest of the subduction of the Malacca Sea Plate um, in the south by the, by the Sangi Trench. And I might refer, refer to the Malacca Sea Plate as the MSP and the Philippine Sea Plate as the PSP, just because they're a mouthful sometimes. So I put those abbreviations in there. Um, so um, the Malacca Sea Plate is now subducting very, very slowly underneath the Eurasian Plate, not quite at the speed it once was. Um, and a lot of it has been cut off um, at the top now because there is, there's no subduction happening. There's been collision. A lot of the plate just sort of disappeared. And so as a result, the Philippine Sea Plate is like, ah, what the heck? I was moving along with all of these gears and now all of these gears are jammed. What am I going to do? 
Um, and so it's still trying to move um, in its own direction. And um, by the gaps, uh, the Malacca Sea Plate has now left sort of gaps um, in the area. And so the Philippine Sea Plate needs to accommodate these gaps um, by uh, creating new types of motion in order to keep the gears running sort of a thing as they were. Um, so this has collided, the Malacca Sea Plate slows down, and then the movement of the Philippine Sea Plate has now been accommodated by uh, the development of a strike-slip fault um, right along here, so right between the suture between um, West Mindano and East Mindano. And then um, it initiated subduction, westward subduction of the PSP, so you have um, a trench that forms right along this dotted line and then eastward subduction of the Malacca Sea Plate. So this is when we start to get our double subduction. So there's um, a trench that forms right along this dotted line, right under Halmahera. Um, so if that's a little bit hard to visualize just by using words in this picture, um, here's like a simple cross section that sort of um, gives it a little bit of a visual. So this isn't quite accurate because it's very simple, um, but here you can imagine Halmahera Island sort of hanging out here, and the island of Mindano uh, should be up here to the north. Um, but what happened, uh, the Philippine Sea Plate, when it's decided to accommodate all of that um, new motion and sort of keep the gears running, um, that's when the Philippine Sea Plate, uh, Philippine, sorry, Philippine Fault uh, propagated here, and then the Philippine Trench propagated to the west, and the Halmahera Trench, which was um, the eastward subduction of the Malacca Sea Plate, uh, propagated down here. And uh, there was continued subduction um, along the western side, so it continued um, to subduct underneath the Eurasian Plate. But here is sort of where it looks like a cross section. So here you have your strike slip fault and your Philippine Trench. And then down here, you have your uh, Sangi Trench, your Malacca Sea, and your Halmahera Trench. So here's your uh, double subduction. Here's our U shape um, with not with the collision complex not quite there yet, um, but it will be. So here we are five million years ago. So previously we were looking at 10 million years. Now we're looking at five million years. So here is where um, this collision has happened. So here's our collision zone. It is now a strike slip fault in order to accommodate where uh, the Philippine Sea Plate is moving. So a lot of the Malacca Sea Plate has basically disappeared now um, and has basically manifested itself down here, mostly in the south. Um, you can see that there is still an active volcanic arc on the uh, western side on the Eurasian Plate because subduction is still active on that side. And there is now a trench on its uh, eastern side subducting beneath Halmahera. Um, you'll notice that there is still no volcanic activity on Halmahera at this point, and that's just because subduction had basically just initiated, and so um, the slab was not yet deep enough to produce the magma to create a volcanic arc. So Halmahera is still Halmahera Island, not um, Halmahera Volcanic Arc. <clears throat> so then moving to three million years ago, here we can see that this uh, Philippine Fault has propagated even more southward as the Malacca Sea Plate begins to shrink. Uh, the Philippine Trench also propagates southwards as this continues to shrink. Um, and now the eastward side is deep enough to create active volcanism on Halmahera. So here now our slab has reached at least 100 kilometers and our magma begins to rise up um, and turns Halmahera Island into Halmahera Volcanic Arc. Um, on the western side, it looks as though volcanic uh, activity had ceased for a little bit. Um, probably just because things were closing up and things were shifting in all different directions, so most, there was most likely a lot of eastern movement rather than western movement. <clears throat> so then moving to 0.5 million years ago, um, this is almost modern day. So here we have our uh, strike slip fault up here continuing to propagate to the south and the Philippine Trench uh, still propagating to the south. Um, you'll notice that there's still no volcanism up here um, by the Philippine Trench, um, and that's just because of the sort of oblique nature of that subduction zone. So the slab can't quite get deep enough to produce uh, volcanism in that area, and the uh, strike slip fault sort of carries all of the all of the collision um, complex material um, along it. So it, it's it's a little oblique and and not necessarily straightforward, and so it's hard to um, make volcanoes there basically. But um, 
the Malacca Sea Plate you'll see is barely non-existent now. It's pretty much dead. Um, subduction is still initiated on both sides. So now you have a uh, volcanic arc on both sides. Halmahera is still active. The Sangi arc is still active on this side. Um, and this trench continues to propagate downward. Um, so then this leads us to present day, um, where our uh, Malacca Sea Plate is, is pretty much gone. It's d dead. It's beneath the surface. Um, and now all we're left with is this collision complex that exists here. Um, and we can see it uh, exposed on this little island up here. Um, that connects directly with the Philippine Fault. <coughs> um, the Philippine Trench uh, has continued to propagate to the south, and some people um, theorize that it is also connected to the Sarong Fault Zone, which exists as a border between the Australian Plate and the Malacca Sea Plate and the Philippine Sea Plate um, to the south. <coughs> um, the Halmahera arc and the Sangi arc are still active in their volcanism, but because the uh, Malacca Sea Plate has pretty much disappeared and will continue to disappear, um, it's most likely in its final stages of volcanism. And if those islands ever do end up colliding, the volcanoes will most likely be um, inactive. So here is sort of a final cross-section um, of what it looks like in modern day, just so you can more easily visualize what's happening. So up here we have our Philippine Fault, our Strike Slip Fault, cutting down through Mindano, our Philippine Trench on this side with subduction underneath that, um, and here we have our Malacca Sea Plate beneath the surface with our collision complex on top and our two volcanic arcs on either side, um, and then down here all of this is bordered and cut off uh, from the Australian Plate by this Sarong Fault Zone, which we'll get into looking at in a little bit. Um, but here are some seismicity plots. So uh, here, down here is Halmahera, here is the northern arm of Sulawesi. So again, blue represents shallow, red represents deep. Um, and like I said before, that high central ridge part, that collision zone where a lot of the activity is happening, is full of shallow seismicity, a lot of shallow earthquakes um, in that area. Uh, interestingly, the only deep earthquakes we see are on the Eurasian side, but if you think about the history of the area, it sort of makes sense because the Malacca Sea Plate had been subducting under Eurasia um, for much longer than it had been subducting under Halmahera. So the plate, it would make sense that the um, slab would be much deeper on that side than it would on uh, the other side. So again, if we plot this on sort of a, a 3D model, we can see the Eurasian side um, is much deeper. We have our lovely U with our high ridge with uh, very high uh, seismicity and then our uh, much shallower slab on the underneath of Halmahera. <clears throat> so Halmahera, in summary, um, there was collision between the East and West Mindano, which impeded the subduction of the MSP, the Malacca Sea Plate, and then continued uh, PSP movement had to be accommodated, and so that caused the development of strike slip faults and new subduction trenches, which eventually led to the death of the Malacca Sea Plate. <clears throat> All right, so we've gone over two different sections of um, Eastern Indonesia. We've gone over the Banda Arc down here, which is sort of a plunging syncline um, around the uh, Australian continental margin and the Eurasian plate. And then we went over the two colliding volcanic arcs to the north, which has to do with the PSP, the MSP, and the Eurasian plate. So now we're going to look at New Guinea and the Sarong Fault System, which lies directly in between. Um, so there's, oh, I forgot I had a square there. There's a lot um, sort of to talk about with this fault zone because this is one of the world's most major uh, fault systems um, in the, yeah, one of the most major fault systems in the world. Um, so there's a lot you could talk about looking at uh, fault rocks and its general geometry and what's moving where. Um, it's a left lateral strike slip fault, but we're just going to sort of break it down to its uh, very basic and how it relates to um, the plates surrounding it. So um, at its very basic, um, the Sarong Fault sort of separates the Australian continental crust from the uh, more arc and oceanic crust um, to the north um, of the Halmahera region. So it sort of serves as a brick wall between the um, Australian continental plate and the um, Philippine Sea Plate and the Malacca Sea Plate. Um, so here we're just kind of going to go over like how it um, 
propagated in a sense, but also be looking at how other islands are moving um, in relation to that fault zone. So here, this was 35 million years ago. This is what I uh, wanted you to conjure um, when we were thinking about the Banda arc. Um, so here, our Australian continental margin has not yet interacted with our trench um, and has not impacted the um, Eurasian plate yet. So uh, you can see little bits and pieces of some familiar islands. So here we have on the Eurasian plate, southwestern Sulawesi and north Sulawesi. And then down in the south, we have, um, or on the Australian uh, continental margin, we have southeastern Sulawesi and eastern Sulawesi. Um, that's part of our fist, our projection that initially punched this uh, trench. Um, over here, we have what will become our Banda arc. So this is our Banda embayment. Um, and then over here, we have our uh, little Halmahera Island, which will eventually make its way along the Sarong Fault up to where um, it is today. Um, so that was 35 million years ago. So then looking at 20 million years ago, we can sort of compare the changes. So here is when our fist made contact, punched right into that trench, sort of wibbled wobbled all these things around. So now um, it's harder for things to subduct in this area because all of this uh, buoyant continental crust is now in the way. So this trench is trying to mold its way um, into where there is colder, denser material um, to take in sort of a thing. So that's this hasn't yet quite made contact with the Banda embayment. It will very soon though. Um, on this side, things got a little messed up because a lot of continental crust is now um, interacting with um, the plates over here. And so there's not a lot, a lot to subduct in this direction anymore. And so um, a straight slip fault then propagated. And this is what carried the uh, East Philippines um, to the North. Uh, looking at 10 million years ago, um, here now we see our Banda arc is starting to take shape here. Um, the slab rollback has initiated and um, the initiation of the uh, North Banda Basin extension has begun to happen. Our fist is sort of breaking up um, and a result of this breakup and also um, the lack of subduction in that direction has sort of changed um, the trench geometry around there. So instead of this now being a trench, it has changed into the Sarong Fault Zone. So it is now a left lateral strike slip fault. Um, that has propagated through here in order to accommodate the continued northward um, migration of the uh, Australian plate um, as opposed to the stationary uh, nature of the Eurasian plate. <clears throat> um, and looking at here, we can look at for some of our favorite islands. So here's our uh, Sulawesi starting to come together. So here's the western side and the northern arm all sort of, sort of suturing together and moving out of the way as this fist sort of punches it um, off to the side. And then down here we have Halmahera, and you'll notice that Halmahera sort of travels along this strike slip fault that has um, now propagated here. So um, the location of Halmahera is very much directly related to um, the initiation of that Sarong fault zone. Um, and up here we have our uh, Sangi arc. So then moving to five million years ago, so here we have Halmahera. It's traveled very far along westward um, along this left lateral strip fault, uh, left lateral strike slip fault. Um, our Banda arc uh, is almost fully uh, formed here with our North Banda basin. Our fist is pretty much disintegrated, um, and you'll notice that little bits and pieces of uh, other islands are traveling along this fault zone and sort of moving towards uh, Sulawesi over here. So. The, the bottom arms, the eastern arms of Sulawesi are starting to uh, sort of accrete themselves um, onto this island um, via the Sarong Fault uh, system. Um, so that's basically um, it for what I'm going to talk about for the Sarong Fault. Um, if you're really interested in that fault, I highly recommend reading up on it because it, it is a, it's very interesting uh, as a fault system. But uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to think of it as that um, sort of brick wall between our Australian continent and our Philippine Sea Plate and our Balaka Sea Plate. <clears throat> so the relationship there is that um, the Australian crust could not subduct anymore. There was nowhere for it to subduct. It was um, uh, too buoyant. It couldn't make it under. So as a result, the stress sort of um, manifested itself as then a strike slip fault instead of as a um, more I guess, thrust fault, or as or a, a more uh, compressive type fault. Um, so 
for New Guinea and the Sarong Fault System, it basically serves for the purposes of this presentation as the southern boundary of the MSP and the PSP. So it separates the Australian continental crust and the arc slash oceanic crust of the MSP and PSP, and that it was originally part of the subduction zone, but then uh, eventually propagated itself as um, a left lateral strikes at fault. Um, all right, so we've gone over the Banda Basin, uh, Banda Basin, Banda Arc. Um, we've gone over the two colliding volcanic arcs to the north, and we've gone over their brick wall in between that has separated um, those plates from each other. Now we are going to talk about the amalgamation of all of these tectonic processes in the form of Sulawesi. There's my square. So um, Sulawesi is um, an island that's sort of an amalgamation of continental material, uh, island arc material, and ophiolite material. Um, and it's split into what are called tectonic provinces. So there's four tectonic provinces on um, Sulawesi. So you have the uh, western side, which is the Plutano volcanic arc. You have the central um, section, which is a metamorphal, sorry, metamorphic belt. Um, then we have eastern Sulawesi, which is an ophiolite belt. And then we have these two um, blocks off to the side, um, which are the Bangasula and Tukang Besi blocks. Um, <clears throat> so looking at that sort of configuration, it makes it look as though there was almost one collision event that sort of produced that. So you have a volcanic arc on one side with a metamorphic belt in the middle and some ophiolites. So it looks like the ophiolites kind of squished on um, to this uh, volcanic arc and then there was a metamorphic belt in between, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, instead of being one collision event, it was most likely uh, two or three. So um, there was at least uh, one collision event, um, I think in the early Miocene, that um, where an ophiolite sort of collided um, with Sulawesi and Sutradon. And then after that, there were at least two other uh, events where pieces began to travel along our favorite Sarong fault zone and sort of attach themselves uh, to the Sulawesi island. Um, so looking at this island, you can see that it's pretty faulted up. So in the past, since it's gone through so many collision events, um, it has a lot of sutures, it has a lot of uh, weak points, um, and it's continuing to undergo deformation to this day. So like, if you know where it's located on the map, um, there's the Banda arc sort of squishing happening to the south. You have your death of the Malacca sea plate to the north, even involving the northern arm of Sulawesi. And then you have the, the, the Sarong fault zone sort of cutting almost directly into the middle of this that's continuing to push little pieces um, that it takes uh, mostly from the bird's head microcontinent um, off and it travels along there, along the Philippine sea plate and then accretes themselves um, to the Sulawesi um, whole structure that's happening here. So there's a lot of deformation. And so the result of all of this deformation is that um, new faults are constantly being activated. Old faults are constantly being reactivated. There's a lot of thrusting in the area. It's just Sulawesi is a constantly ever evolving um, island. Um, and so looking at the seismicity, you won't see any really deeper earthquakes because it's not like there's a um, deeply subducted slab underneath this island. Um, but it is a very uh, faulted island, so you'll see a big cluster of shallow seismic events along uh, this fault that sort of cuts through the island. And there's a lot of um, other seismic events um, to the north, and that's just due to the amount of like thrusting um, and faulting that is constantly happening um, on this island uh, as a result of the continuing tectonic motions uh, around it. Um, so here's just sort of that picture that I showed earlier um, of our 35 million year ago image, just so you can see like where the pieces sort of came from. So you have your uh, Eurasian pieces, your southwestern and your northern Sulawesi that started over here. And then you have your uh, southeastern um, Sulawesi and your eastern Sulawesi on the uh, Australian side of things. Um, and eventually, as we know, our fist punched through. And uh, this little dotted line uh, shows the present position of this southwestern Sulawesi. So as this fist came in, these two sort of migrated this way and uh, formed themselves into that sort of T-shape. Um, and then as the fist sort of disintegrated and the Sarong fault zone then propagated through it, it carried um, these two pieces and eventually latched them on um, 
and then eventual pieces of uh, bird's head and other such travel along um, the Philippine Sea Plate and also attach themselves there. So that's why there's so much um, craziness happening on that island. There's a lot to explain. I can't quite get into the uh, details in this presentation due to time, but um, I highly recommend looking into it if you're really interested. Um, so Sulawesi uh, sort of serves as pieces of the puzzle. So it's the result of collision between continental, ophiolitic, and island arc fragments. Um, so there was an emplacement of ophiolite in the early Miocene, which was followed by uh, two more collision events in the southeast and eastern Sulawesi as fragments travel along that uh, Sarong fault zone. Um, so that's basically um, the entirety of the eastern uh, Indonesian tectonic world. I mean, that was uh, very much simplified to fit uh, within the, the time limit. There's um, a lot more to talk about in that area because it, it is a very complicated area. But um, we sort of explored uh, the relationship between all of these plates with each other and how they, they're all sort of interacting um, and have interacted in the past to form um, what we see today. So sort of a summary, if we're going to sum up each section in um, sort of a one sentence uh, phrase. So first we have the uh, Banda Arc, which is the result of a trench uh, molding itself to the Australian continental margin. Um, then we have the Halmahera Arc, which uh, was the result of the death of the Molucca Sea Plate due to collision and then the continuing migration of the Philippine Sea Plate. Um, and then we have New Guinea slash the Sarong Fault System, which serves as the boundary between the Australian Plate and the MSP slash the, the PSP. And then we have uh, Sulawesi, which is our amalgamation of fragments transported along faults due to the movement of those aforementioned plates. <clears throat> um, so that's all that very much simplified. <laughs> but um, if you had at any point any uh, trouble trying to envision what I was talking about, because I know at least for me, sometimes it's really hard if somebody's just like saying words and has one picture. Like I can't exactly imagine all of these plates moving together at once. Um, I found this plate reconstruction video, um, which is actually based on a model by Robert Hall, who is sort of um, very much an expert in the tectonics in the area. Um, and I watched this video a couple times um, just to sort of understand how everything was um, interacting with each other. Um, so I'm not going to play it here just because maybe technical issues and also copyright issues, um, maybe. But um, I think if you get these presentations, you can definitely watch it um, and it might help. Uh, you can definitely see like the slab rollback happening in the Banda embayment while um, like Halmahera is moving along the Sarong fault zone uh, at the same time. So it, it's super helpful to sort of uh, piece all those pieces together instead of looking at them in separate little chunks. Um, and then lastly, here are my references. If you're really interested in this stuff, I highly recommend reading some of these papers because um, they're very interesting. They were very, they're very fun to read and a lot of these people um, have done really great research. Um, but that's about it for lecture four. I hope you enjoyed and I guess I'll see you um, when I do my next one. Bye.